Thank you everyone for joining us for our very first edition of the Skylight Speaker Series presented by the Sweet Talks Guild. Um, we, we will be getting t-shirts for that uh, later on and uh, Jen will be sure to, to, to get you one when, when we have that. <laughs> um, we are very excited. We're gonna be doing these uh, monthly, we hope. We're trying to bring in speakers from the outside uh, world, some from government, some from civic tech, some from other fields to really talk about the work that all of you are doing, that all of us are doing, so you can get a different perspective on things and hopefully learn some stuff as well. Uh, today, as you can see, we have Jen Noina. She is with currently a fellow at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation, full disclosure, my former employer. So uh, I'm very pleased to have her here. She is also a US digital service vet and so has good insight on both sides of the uh, civic tech world, has been on the inside, has now been on the outside and coming to it from a slightly different angle. Um, she's worked in tech, healthcare, financial services, and done lots of different things. So she has lots of great insight for us. So it should be a fun, fun show. And without further ado, I hand things off to Jen. Jen, take it away. Thanks so much for that amazing intro, Ori. Um, and thanks everyone for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so excited to see all these lovely faces. Um, I can just go ahead and jump in. I know, Chris, you said um, to please turn on your camera, but I do also just kind of want a disclaimer that like, I know we're constantly on Zoom and it can be very exhausting. So I was going to say, if you don't want to have your camera on during my presentation, you can turn it off. It has been a crazy week. So I encourage folks to, you know, take whatever you need right now. Um, just because I am constantly exhausted being on Zoom. So I hear you. Um, so today, like Ori mentioned, um, I'm going to go over this topic, digital transformation by design. And we will have a few breakout room activities um, throughout the presentation, so hopefully you'll be interactive. But at any given time, feel free to um, just jump in the chat and share your thoughts or, um, or any questions you might have. Um, and I'll try to monitor it as we go along. I think Ori will also monitor it as well. So yeah, my name is Jen and my background is in human-centered design. So like Ori mentioned, I was at the US Digital Service for two and a half years and I'm currently at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation. We are a hub within Georgetown University that's reimagining systems for public impact using design, data, and technology. And at the Beck Center, we call the field that we're in public interest tech. It's I recognize like a super academic and funder focused way of describing the field, but just a heads up that that's kind of like what I've kind of gotten used to calling this field in. So if you hear me saying that, that's why. And I just wanted to say, you know, ever since I've been in the public sector, my North Star has been about creating a government that serves the needs of the people. So today I do that by exploring how best to enable the workforce and people doing this work looking at ways to best create inclusive environments where people can thrive and figuring out things like what it takes to make sure that the workforce represents and reflects um, you know, the demographics of the US. Prior to coming to public service and the public interest tech field, I worked in the private sector for a handful of companies, typically as like a product or interaction designer but I have always been involved in civic engagement in one way or another. I always joke that I was that annoying resident who would show up to city council meetings and demand change. Um, I joke about it, but really that was me. So when I found out about the US Digital Service and saw that they were hiring designers, I really jumped at the chance to join. My favorite advice someone gave me during my first week in government was to trust my process. She said something along the lines of, there are going to be times when you feel like you know nothing in this space and you're gonna struggle with how to add value, but we are experts in what we do know. So trust that, follow your process, lean into it and let that guide your work. And to be honest, at the time I was like, what is she talking about? 
you know, it was my first week at USDS. I was still wearing my rose colored glasses, but my first week turned into my second week. And then that turned into my third week. And I realized that she was right. I didn't know anything about government. And to be honest, that second week, it felt like I was drinking from the fire hose of acronyms, bureaucracy and hierarchy. So this is actually our first breakout. Um, we were gonna have folks separate into um, groups for five minutes to kind of chat about this prompt. So thinking back to your first time working in and around government, what was your experience like? Was there anything you felt like you were drinking from the fire hose from? And do you have anyone have any favorite acronyms? Awesome. Well, I hope everyone had a fruitful discussion in your breakout rooms. Um, I know in mine, we chatted a lot about um, the hierarchy and how different it is coming from a place like tech, um, even just like the information overload and knowing where to go. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if anyone else felt this way, but you know, when I first joined, I felt like maybe whoever hired me made a mistake, like that maybe I wasn't the right person to be here because I didn't know anything about government. But I remembered um, my coworker's advice, right? She told me to trust my process. And I leaned into what I did know about human-centered design. And I realized that a lot of the work I did and still do falls under this bucket um, we call digital transformation. So digital transformation feels like this buzzword that everyone's been throwing around, and in some ways, it is. Um, but our goal shouldn't be to digitally transform government. That should be the means to an end. Our goal should be to create a government that's easy to interact with and allows the public to get the services that they need. So digital transformation in government can mean three things. Making things accessible online, moving from transaction-based interactions to building relationships with the public, and also allowing folks to interact with government in a way that works for them. So these are the, the some of the ways that I think um, we should get there through digital transformation. And I also wanna say that digital transformation isn't something that can only be done inside of government. We can make we can help make a lot of changes even on the outside as vendors, contractors, and where I am right now in academia. The side note here is that I never in a thousand years thought I would be in academia, but here I am and I surprisingly love it. Um, I encourage everyone to try it. We get all of the major holidays off, we get spring break off, it's pretty great. So I'm gonna spend the rest of this presentation going over three things I've learned while working in public interest tech and how to impact digital transformation in government. So the first one is to start by understanding where the agency department or team you're a part of is at. So we're usually invited to fix a technology problem, but as I'm sure everyone here knows, that's really only a third of what we offer it's about this trifecta of what we can do, right? It's technology, people, and process. And this whole trifecta is about understanding the current technology that exists, the people who support it and use it, and what processes it supports. So if we are able to bridge these three pieces, we can find that sweet spot and really provide that value. So I usually do this through a handful of things. So I end up doing a lot of like informal interviews with stakeholders and people on the team. I speak to end users and I speak to project leadership. And then we get to the team together to do sort of like a whiteboard map or activity of everything the team has learned. So this one here is an example of one I did a while ago for um, a case study on clean transportation. And I will say oftentimes system maps are not so formal. I haven't done a formal system map in a while now. It's, you know, this is a tool that I've used in the past to really help everyone on the team just to understand the ecosystem in which we're working within. Understand what does government look like and what are all the different levers. And this is really where system thinking comes into play. And we begin to see things like parts and holes, system interdependencies, where boundaries are, what the structure looks like, and what networks exist. 
And so for our second prompt for the next breakout room, um, you'll get five minutes again to discuss. Um, the question I have here is, have you done a mapping like this before? What parts of the system do you typically notice? And is there anything when you're working within the system that is government, um, anything that surprises you? Awesome. I hope everyone had a fruitful second breakout. Um, as you probably discussed, everyone may know just kind of a different thing, right? Um, or they know, might notice a different thing when they're um, in your, you know, in your environment, in your space. And I find that that's really kind of the benefit of doing the system map with teams, um, especially teams with multiple disciplines, because as a designer, I'll notice, you know, things very differently than my engineer or product colleagues. And so, um, when thinking about the environment you're working within and understanding the structures and influences and connections, one of the things that I try to understand at the beginning is the root cause of the problem versus seeing the systems. So um, Mark Lerna has a really great written piece about this, about systems versus symptoms that goes into depth about these two things. So I'm going to just share this link here. Um, but basically, like we might be asked to fix the symptoms. But I find that our value is really in understanding the root of the problem and making sure that we're fixing the right things. So I always try to keep this like image in my mind whenever I'm on a team to just be like, okay, are we looking at the top of the trees only? How do we get down to those roots? So all of these activities in this kind of like start by understanding phase is really just to help you figure out how to be effective in this space. And what I find is that it's about balancing the appetite for change with the feasibility of it. Um, so my solutions end up being tailored very much to the environment in which we're working in because some teams might have you know, a bigger appetite for change and be like, yeah, let's do all these things versus others might have to do things more incrementally. So then digging in further, um, digital transformation is usually, well, I guess it's mostly about you know, moving from a paper process to a digital one. And it's really easy for teams to just take this paper process, digitize everything, but keep the process the same. And what I find that's helpful here is instead of thinking about replicating the process, for teams to kind of switch gears a little bit and think about how would we digitize this process, but think about it in terms of offering our constituents, our users, um, people that are interacting with our systems and services as a service. So I use this opportunity very much so to completely reimagine the process as a service. So I start by bringing in folks that are in and around the process and give them the permission to both co-create and design something completely from scratch. So I push really hard and say, you know, this is the ideal state for the service and, you know, recognize that this is going to be very speculative. And I encourage folks to come with their crazy big ideas and anything that they've ever imagined. So after a session like that, then we start to walk it back a few steps. And this is where I apply the feasibility, viability, and desirability lens to really meet somewhere in the middle and find a solution that actually works as a digital transformation. And as we're doing this work, I often find that simply asking questions to create change within the team um, is one way to start. So for example, on one of my projects, the team we were working with were you know, heads down building a thing, but they never really thought about who the actual users were. So they were focused on, hey, we have this paper process, let's Let's turn it into something, you know, like let's try to first make it a PDF that someone could submit with fillable forms. And um, and then they were like trying to build that out into a system. And our team came in and one of the first things we asked was, oh, who are your users? And like, how would your users interact with the system? So like, how would they even access it? What's that flow look like? Um, everyone we spoke to was like, oh, we're not sure. Um, you know, we just assumed it would be the folks that were interacting with it before. And we, we found was, you know, just after just two weeks of being there, 
and just us asking every single person we met, hey, who are your users? Um, the team shifted completely how they worked. And they got together and we were like sitting um, in one of the meetings and they were like, let's actually prioritize our features in a, in a different way. Like, let's figure out who our users are and prioritize the features to make sure that we're building for them. And then lastly, um, from a design perspective, what I find also is being aware of the four levels of design is crucial to digital transformation. So at this first level, the communication level, this is all about information design. So it's asking ourselves, how do we communicate the service? At the second level or product level, it's about um, the product and technology here. So what product do we create to support that service? Um, the third level is the interaction level, and this is about the experience of the people interacting with the service. So what are the ideal interactions like? And then finally, that fourth level, the system level, encompasses the processes, values, and culture that make up the organization. So how does the organization support the service? So as you can see here, the levels move from creating visible and tangible artifacts to creating experiences and then ultimately moves to transforming the organization overall. And last but not least, people are the number one factor for success for digital transformation, not technology. This work is hard and we don't do this work alone. My tip here is to create community, stay connected and take care of one another. Um, I find that like finding the find the people that will support and challenge you, um, lean on them, celebrate them, push each other to do great things, build relationships with your team and your stakeholders. In my darkest moments, and you know I've got a few of them now, given that we're still in a pandemic and inequalities are rampant, I go back to my north star, which is creating a government that serves the needs of the people. So I find motivation in my work and my impact by going and talking to the people that we're servicing to understand their needs. And ultimately what I find is remembering who we're doing this work for is what motivates me. So there's so much work to be done in the digital service space. Um, everyone here is doing such great work, just even being at Skylight. Um, I'm here to say like, keep it up. Remember that you're not alone and here's to doing something great. So I'm always here. Um, feel free to reach out at any time. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I know I kind of flew through that. Um, so I was thinking we could kind of open it up for discussions now. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, and I wanted to, A, first say thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and coming. That was, uh, that was great stuff. A lot, of, a lot of things to think about and a lot of good things to remind us of why we do this work that that we do. You just mentioned right there at the end that you know one of the most important things is you know building relationships and creating a community. There really is a pretty good community of public interest technologists uh, out there. We have a lot of uh, folks who are new to the space or you know just uh, just getting started in the space. How can they? join those and, and maybe activate some of those relationships? Yeah, Ori, that's such a great question um, and something I completely forgot to touch on. But yeah, happy to expand here. Um, you know, what I find is that like one of my favorite things is going to some of the conferences that are in this space. So there's a couple that are coming up. Um, the Code for America Summit is happening mid-May. Um, and that's a really great way to just like meet other people in this space. Um, I think it's it's online this year, so it's very easy to just kind of join from home. Um, that same week or maybe the week after is um, the .gov design conference. So if you're a designer, if you're just interested in service design in general, um, I recommend going to that conference as well. Um, and I would say that, you know, in terms of building community, there's a lot of like great Slack groups um, that exist. Um, happy to share some of them. So one of the ones that I found really helpful is one called All Tech is Human. Um, and, you know, they're, they're a little bit wider than just, you know, civic tech and the public interest tech. They're looking at all technology, looking at like AI and um, algorithm bias and things like that. But 
you know, they're still very mission oriented. And I find that like being in a community where people really just care about this work and care about um, like, you know, using tech for good to a certain extent and like the ramifications of technology to be used for good versus um, profit is inspiring, right? Like being in a group of people that like get that that's a thing because I don't think a lot of people do still. Um, and then I'm trying to think if there's any other communities. So um, one of the things that I am working on right now in my fellowship at the Beck Center is building out a professional association for people in this space. Um, that's still TBD. Um, I think we're gonna roll something out um, you know, in mid-May next month. And so happy to kind of share that with Ori and like with other folks, if folks are interested in, you know, all the things that come with a professional association. So training, networking, community building, um, and just like the association, just like being around other people who are doing this work. We're hoping that it's gonna be full of, you know, people in the vendor community, everyone here like you guys and states and federal um, city digital space people or digital service people in the space um, and hope, hoping to like really build and continue to grow on this community. Anyone else have any other questions or anything I might have missed that I should touch on, Ori? I, I'll just say that the, this incredible amount of wisdom sort of distilled there, I think, that was really spot on and uh, just reflected, I think, a lot of the things that I've come to realize, you know, over the years. So um, I thought that was really great. It was a, a great way to kick off our first speaker series. Um, the professional, I forget the that mentioned the, um, you know, I heard, I heard that Bexon was working on some kind of like, sort of recognize this gap around there's not a really good framework or there's not a really good sort of definition of what it means to be a professional in the civic tech space. And uh, I forget the person's name, I know somebody who was working on something at a time, but like, so one of the things that we're doing just as a, as a, as a company, just generally maturing is like defining career levels and roles. And, but we also think as part of that effort, there's an opportunity for us to kind of weigh in on like, what does it mean to be a professional in this space? What does it mean to be a service designer in civic tech? What does it mean to be a user researcher? So we're going to be something we're going to be working on the next few months. And I'd love to try to connect, you know, at some point, see what y'all are you're working on and uh, see if there's some overlap there or synergies or whatever. So, but I'll, I'll stop there and, you know, everyone take the time, take the opportunity here to ask some questions or share any comments. I thought that was really great. Yeah, I think um, I will touch on, you know, it sounded like in the breakout room that I was in, there were a lot of folks that are really new to this space, right? And one of the things that we're seeing at the Beck Center is how um, how people find out about this field, right? And it's typically through word of mouth, um, which is a good thing and also a bad thing because it means that you have to really know someone in this space already to even get in. And that's exclusive, right? And so we're looking at ways of how do we expand this? Um, you know, we're, we're also recognizing that like, there's so many people who are interested in coming here, but maybe they're not enough roles, right? Like there are not a lot of entry level roles here. And so we're looking at ways of like, okay, if we are to define these career ladders and like standardize, you know, what is what does it mean to be a service designer or professional in as a, in civic tech, right? Um, we're also expanding it and saying like, how do we find those service designers and let them know that this is a career path for them? And um, you can kind of stay here and, you know, build your career here and um, that it is a good place for career development. So if anyone, you know, if anyone ever wants to talk shop about like your experience finding um, Skylight or like, you know, your experience in around government, um, happy to chat further about that. Um, if anyone's like, oh, we should do this, right? Why isn't the industry doing this? And like, we're really missing out on these type of folks or, um, or like, oh, this is the thing that frustrates me about this. I'm happy to hear that. All yours. Alex, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, no, thanks, Jen, for the presentation. It was really wonderful. Um, I just, um, I have, I had this question going back and forth in terms of like, what is like a technologist in government and what is a civic technologist? Because I feel like, you know, if you're like not in the public sector, it's like kind of like an easy way to define, but uh, I'm just interested in sort of like a civil engineer is like a technologist in government, but maybe not necessarily a civic technologist. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that, specifically with your ongoing research and defining um, sort of like the field. 
Yeah, thanks so much for that great question. Um, and I, I like sort of smirked because it's something that I we have been struggling with a lot in um, at the Beck Center because you know we talk about this field as like public interest tech, but fully recognize that like that is an academic way of talking about it, and it's we only call it that because it's like what funders are most familiar with, right? Um, but really trying to dig deeper and ask ourselves like, okay, for the people who are in this space, what do we call ourselves, right? Are we digital service technologists? Are we like, does that kind of close out some people who might not feel that they're technology oriented and might be policy oriented um, or like procurement oriented? And in my mind, all of those folks are part of this ecosystem, right? And it kind of begs the question of like, what do we call this ecosystem? Um, I think the jury is still out. Um, the, that's kind of the exciting thing about this being such a new space, right? Like, I think um, folks really joke that we're like in our teenage years, so we haven't fully matured yet. And we have this like crazy opportunity right now to really build the field to be better um, and like become adults that are responsible adults that care about others. Um, and I'm hoping that like, maybe if we can do this right, other industries will take a look at this field and be like, how did they get like good representation, right? How did they get 50-50, um, you know, male, female, or like, you know, good gender um, distribution across this space? Um, yeah, I think that it's like, I don't know, I'd be interested in hearing like, how do people describe the work that you do, right? Like, um, it's like, oh, I, I work in government, I work around government, um, I'm doing, you know, digital service stuff for government, um, and I'm a technologist. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question, Alex, but um, just kind of my rant there. <laughs> Thank you. I just, you know, I think a lot of folks in government, Alex, to your, to your point, yes, like the folks working in the IT shop, uh, you know, plugging in, uh, you know, monitoring servers and, you know, imaging laptops and, and whatever, those are classified in the OPM system as, you know, uh, IT specialists, you know, or information technology specialists. So are all the people from ATF and USDS, just because they don't have a, a job category to separate the two. I and remember. I think that's I one of that. the things that folks are really looking. That's what one of the things that you know from from Jen's side is that they're looking to hey go to OPM and say hey you know what we need to create a new job category to better yeah. define this. And thankfully, now we're starting to see a lot of folks who came from 18F, USDS, you know, elsewhere, getting senior roles in government where they will see that same, well, where they already understand that problem and hopefully they will be able to act on it. Thank you. I've heard public interest technologist and, you know, uh, no common definition. I use them all too, without even really thinking about, you know. <laughs> Anyone else? I mean, I guess, Jen, I'm curious, um, you know, you went from, I think, from USDS to the Beak Center, um, and I'm curious, just as sort of you you thought about your path and your own career trajectory, um, what motivated you to to take on the, the fellowship and the role you're in now? Yeah, that's a really great question, Leslie. Um, to me, the way I talk about the Beck Center is it's this, like, breeding ground for practitioners who have done this work, and we go to the Beck Center to work on the things we wish we could have worked on um, outside of our project work at the USDS or at, you know, 18F or some of the other, um, you know, we have a lot of folks from like state government. We have a lot of folks from city, um, different foundations and things like that. And, um, you know, I sort of started the talk describing how what I'm working on is like workforce issues. 
And I find that like when I was at USGS, I helped with hiring. I helped revamp, you know, our criteria for how we hire designers um, to make sure that we were like hiring the right designers and the type of ones that we needed for the projects we, we, we had to staff. And what I found is that like, I was just so much more interested. Well, I'm very much interested in the project work and sometimes I really miss it. Like I miss, um, you know, during COVID when everything was happening, I'm like, oh, I just want to redesign this vaccine website. It's like so bad. <laughs> or, you know, like those type of things, right? Like the more tangible, like product level things to work on. Um, but there's this other side of me that's also like, you know, th we're only doing this, like, who makes up this field? It's like the people who make up this field, right? And it's so important to have a workforce that feels, you know, fully supported, um, feels like they can fully come to work as themselves and like feel like that they are included and their voices are um, and opinions are valued and welcomed in this space. And so, you know, I think very much it's easy to get lost in the project work, right? To burn out and um, focus on like, this is so mission driven driven. Um, it's, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, I'm going to help so many people by doing this. So I'm going to just forego some of my needs. And like, I will say I experienced that a lot at USDS, right? We're just driven, you know, there's so much work to be done in this space and there's always going to be projects, but realizing that like, sometimes we do need to take a step back and we need, we do need that support from creating the community. And so I really saw that as an opportunity to like give back in that way. Um, and hopefully, like, you know, I think for me, there's also just all the crappy things that are going on in this world right now. Like, how do we, like, how do we internalize that and make this right um, and not just sweep things under the rug like every other industry is doing? Yeah, that was a really good answer. Um, I feel like the, the academic kind of... Um, stop along the journey is like a really viable one because I've always wish I had some time to you know introspect and room and just like I mean it's a different it's, it's just a different world and it's a different set of experiences and learnings that you know and there's there's so much that's I think uh hasn't been sort of like synthesized you know for the benefit of the community and and so I'm very jealous that you have opportunity to you know, maybe let it sink in and then process it and share it, you know, with all of us. And, but we see the benefit of that and what you put together. I mean, it was, you tell a lot of thought and work went into that. It was really impressive. Um, but that's a question that I have for you. How, I mean, this is a space that can experience some, a little bit more burnout than others. Um, what sort of thoughts or tips do you have for folks to kind of manage, you know, that which is a little bit i think more rampant especially you know i think has been one of the criticism usds is like burnout factory yeah um i know usds definitely has that reputation um and i honestly like a lot of the work that i've been doing at the beck center is centered on leadership and management because it's just too much to ask the people like the workforce to take this on right like it's really this question of as leader, um, you know, as someone who's managing teams, like recognizing that you have power here and like recognizing how do you use that power to support your workforce? Um, and so there's that, right? There's this whole, um, you know, leaders step up and recognize this and like let's normalize practices um, that are going to add value and help rejuvenate the people who are doing the work. Um, as someone who is an individual contributor, right? What can you do about burnout? And I think it, like, I kind of speak to it a little bit earlier, but like setting boundaries is so key. And it's easier to say, set boundaries, right? Like I am so guilty of, I have these boundaries and then I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna eat lunch today because I have to send out these emails. And I don't, I was, I've been in meetings all day and, um, you know, this has to happen. Um, so like getting together as a team and being like, okay, this is our product roadmap. Um, how do we build in breaks? Or like, how do we like, this is the ideal, but like, let's go on the other side and say like, if this took a little bit longer, what would that mean? Right? And just recognizing, hey, resourcing right now, is everyone expected to work 100%, 80%, 50%, 30%, right? Like, it's a, it's, 
it's for year one plus of the pandemic and I don't see a lot of groups having those conversations um so I like would encourage like that's one way that we've done it or that I've done it at the Beck Center with um like the students that I work with and like all right this was our task let's talk about assuming that we're all working at 50% because we probably are um how does that impact our timelines and um and what I find the last thing is really just, you know, recognizing that what's helped me the most is that, like, we aren't just who we are when we go to work, right? There's a life outside of, like, we have lives outside of work. And how do we bring that in so f- folks feel, you know, seen in a certain extent, right? Um, I know that for me, at the Beck Center, we, like, we start off our meetings just kind of really casually, right? Like, we aren't expected to jump into like work 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 right away right like you know I can share good news I can share bad news and like I don't feel like that's like a bad thing to do so I feel like I'm showing up a hundred percent authentically me and like that helps me feel like I'm part of the community that I'm doing something larger than myself and it helps me for sure feel like I'm not um or it's like helping me mitigate my burnout at least Because to me, I find like it's relationship building and like that's really what keeps people engaged at work um, and helps people not stress out. That was really good. Hey, Jen. Um, So I'm curious in regards to all the events from 2020 and 2021, um, how has a lot of what's been revealed in the violence, uh, especially those who are BIPOC. Um, how has that influenced and changed the way you approach your work and your motivation for staying within um, public interest? Yeah, I'll start. Um, that's a really great question, Kenny. I'll start with the end of your, like your last question of like, it's made me want to stay even more because I very much live in this motto that like we create the future that we want to see. Um, and it's easy to just be like, oh, this is, you know, I, I will be honest, I've had moments of hopelessness when, you know, you hear about another police shooting, you hear about another um, wave of discrimination against BIPOC folks. And, but like, I let myself feel that despair in the moment. And then I also am like, all right, we got to create change. And um, I'm hoping that everyone else here feels empowered to feel that way as well, Um, whether that be through work, you know, in this field or just personally, right, if these are things that you care about. And so that being said, um, I feel like more than ever, it's important to have people who represent um, and, you know, look like the rest of America to be in this field and do this work because then we have more diversity and we have diversity of experiences and perspectives. Um, How has that influenced my work at the Beck Center? It completely has. Um, You know, I think before when I was putting, when I was doing this research, um, it was a lot of like, how do I phrase this or how do I frame this as something that's going to be beneficial to quote unquote the bottom line right and even though we don't have the bottom line here it's like we still have metrics of what that bottom line looks like right it's like getting services out or um you know delivering product by a certain deadline or um you know things of those sort right like this idea of like what productivity is and I've really just kind of like taken a step away from that. And instead of saying like, we should do these things because it has this beneficial impact to the sector. um, I've really framed it as like, we should do these things because this is the right thing to do as humans. This is the right thing to do by our employees. Um, This is the right thing to do just, you know, for our country, right? And it's less about this bottom line, but more about like, who are we? We work 40 hours a week and we dedicate so much time to our jobs. And so it's like, how do we create a space in which everyone can thrive? And it's not for the, it's not for like productivity, right? It's for, because like we care about people. And so I really reframed my research to focus on that. Um, I will say it's been 
kind of a battle because that's not a dialogue that a lot of people are comfortable hearing, right? Like people want to see the numbers, they want to see the metrics. Um, and those are there, right? Like I don't have to go into like how, you know, diversity increase, like an increase of diversity means an increase of productivity by this percent, like those exist, um, but no one's really talking about it from the people perspective. And so I think it's important to really humanize. Um, and I'm very much on this mission to like normalize that, up, that perspective. five minutes <laughs> every time you talk something really good is said so somebody come up with something <laughs> so i'm still trying to grapple with how to phrase my question um but a word that i key in on from some of the answers is the focus around community um and i definitely agree with that in terms of like how important community is especially when it comes to supporting people in general. And so I'm curious if you have like ideas or inputs on how um, companies can support local communities more in terms of their work they're doing for the people on the ground. And I key in on local communities because I think local communities are the ones that have the most understanding of what is happening on the ground level and like what support is needed in the immediate sense. Um, so yeah, I just want to put that out there and ask for any advice or tips you might have for how companies can better support the local efforts. Yeah, I think, um, thank you so much for bringing that up. I don't think that that's something that's being talked about enough right now. Um, and I think that I think it's a little bit hard being in this like social impact nonprofit slash like public sector space, right? Like this isn't just, you know, I've been researching and like trying to study this space just in terms of like social impact, like as a whole, not just like this government tech or like civic tech space. And um, it kind of goes back to this whole thing that like, we almost hide behind this excuse of like, oh, we're all mission driven, so we care. <laughs> and like, I think that kind of like, for some reason, it absolves certain organizations from actually like doing the real work. Um, and so for me, it's been a lot of like, one, like targeting leadership and HR and talent and like those folks to really say, hey, these are the things you need to look at. Right, one of them being um, like supporting local communities where you're located. Um, then the other hand is like, what can we as like the workforce do as individual contributors in this space do? Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things coming out right now of like, is there a manifesto that we all sign that's like, this is like, this is what we demand for this industry, right? Is there, um, are there a list of values that we all align around versus just like aligning around um, the organization values that we're a part of? Um, and then the last thing I'll say about that is like, how do we hold our employers accountable and companies accountable? Um, and so that is something I don't have an answer to yet, but it is something that I have is like, um, in like my roadmap of things, like we're, we're potentially taking a look at like a playbook of sorts and like with templates and like toolkits that show, right, how do we, how do we enable the workforce to hold employ or the employers accountable? Um, things with like pay transparency or, um, you know, more transparency on your recruitment process and things like that. Um, and so I think that that's like TBD to be um, to come. But I do, I do appreciate that question, and um, and yeah, so it's like looking at it from two different perspectives, almost. Thank you. Appreciate your answer, and for just holding space for all this, all these great conversations. 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me, everyone. Um, You'll have my info. Feel free to connect um, in any way. Feel free to reach out. It's really my pleasure being here. For people jet, um, I just want to let you know that you can continue the conversation in our Sweet Talks channel. If you want to swing by, we're looking for volunteers, or if you want to start a thread, um, happy to have you. Thanks again, Jen.